All right, welcome to the Swine Time Podcast here at Pipestone. I am your host, Dr. Spencer Wayne. I'm one of the staff veterinarians here, one of the owners in the, in the group as well. And I have the great pleasure of interviewing people both within and without our company that have some level or some area of expertise uh, in topics of interest to our group. So today I have Dr. Evan Cope. Evan Cope, um, I'll just let you take it over from here. Why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Evan Cope. I'm a uh, associate vet with Pipestone. I've I've been with the company for approximately um, going on three years plus some more. But uh, uh, originally from Southwest Minnesota, uh, and then today would live in South Dakota. Um, majority of the farms I would cover would be mainly in South Dakota, and well, really all of them are in South Dakota today. Majority of clients would be South Dakota, Minnesota, and then uh, Northwest Iowa. So, pleasure to be here today, Spencer. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And so, topic today, you've been brought in to discuss your area of expertise currently with regard to this topic is guilt multiplication. Uh, you know, people are familiar with guilt multiplication, but it's going to be worth hitting some of those points, you know, point by point. Before we get into that, though, I have a question for you. The, ter- the term, the name, big cat. What does that mean? If if somebody were to refer to you as big cat, like as a nickname, where did that come from? Do you have any comments about that? Uh, yeah, uh, not not many comments on it. I would say that that all dates back to even high school days. So uh, okay. just a a friend from high school that uh, gave it, and that it kind of stuck, I guess, into college and whatnot. Is some right. roommates of mine in college with that from high school as well. So. Okay. Well, I yeah. didn't I didn't introduce you as Dr. Big Cat, but you can guess who put me up to asking you about the Big Cat nickname before we walked in here. I'm sure that was a Hayden question. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly who it was. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Big Cat. Hayden. I mean, <laughs> Evan. Why don't you take us through a little bit of like the, the what is multiplication, uh, just in general terms, because people are familiar with guilt, you know, I mean, replacement guilt, but they may do it in different ways. So what is multiplication just in broad strokes? Yeah, so uh, I'll probably take a step back even more and just kind of get into why within Pipestone are we talking more about multiplication. Uh, Pipestone has began offering more multiplication or managing more multipliers uh, from what we used to do in the past. Uh, And really now we'll get into what is multiplication. If we think of genetics, especially on the sow standpoint, right? We have to have, uh, what's the genetic makeup of those females? So it would be, you have your elite genetic animals at the nucleus level, and then those have to blend down to the multiplier level and then get exactly what a multiplier state, what the name implies. You have to multiply those animals to, to get to be enough numbers that can go into you know, our commercial sow farms. So really, that would be what a multiplier is. It would be a, uh, it would be a farm that takes elite genetic females and then increases their numbers, sparrows them out, increases their numbers that uh, makes gilts and that would go into commercial cell farms. Okay, you made a comment that you know we are doing more multiplication than we used to do, mm-hmm. and we used to do none. So it's it's nothing to something. Actually, I take that back because. You know, 30 years ago, we did multiplication. That was actually the first farm was it was guilt supply for other farmers that still had their sows. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, history always repeats itself. So Pipeson actually started up back in the late 80s uh, with a multiplier farm. Uh, you know, management started by managing a multiplier for family farmers, for shareholders. And then it, it morphed into more on the commercial side. And then, uh, yeah, about 30 years later, here we are circling back around to it again yeah. so yeah. Well, two two main approaches to replacing your gilts uh you can do internal multiplication or you can buy gilts from somebody who does it or another site that does it even if it's the same company so um i think of you know most hutterite colonies in the past which if listeners are out there hutterites are uh, groups of folks out in south dakota that generally have multiple types of industries on their on their farm uh and one of those is usually pigs and most of those would have been internal multiplication, making your own gilts. Uh, other folks would do it as well. Generally, farms that are smaller would have that, correct? Correct, yeah. Uh, and the reason why 
generally smaller farms would have that. I, I'd say that's correct. The reason why, uh, why don't all sow farms, commercial sow farms out there just multiply and make their own yields? Well, a lot of it comes down to the challenges of the management involved to do that. You're essentially having two different populations in your sow farm, and it takes a, a very broad and intensive management then to, to be able to do both of those. The other thing is just from a genetic progress standpoint, we continually uh, try to put the best genetics in place on, on the guilt side, right? And, you know, we'll be honest, previously, we our goal was throughput, right? We're trying to put out, you know, a good quality, healthy pig to the shareholders. And when you start trying to manage two different populations within the farm, we just wanted to make sure we weren't taken away from the goal of getting the best pig to the shareholders. Yeah, you know, in cases in the past where somebody's done internal multiplication and they haven't done it well, they haven't selected because they've been focused on other things, but they haven't selected the best replacement females. Mm -hmm. You know, I always looked at that and said they dropped the ball, <laughs> and you can never pick it up like you had it before because you lost a year, you've lost two years. Even if you're getting the best replacement uh, or the best semen to come in, you still got the animal that you didn't select the right the first time. So you're always half a step behind somebody that's doing it well. Is that correct? Yeah, very, very true on that, Spencer. You're, you're, uh, uh, it, it can, it can get messed up very fast, and then uh, you're right. If you get behind the eight ball on the genetic progress of those females, yeah, you're, you're, you could be multiple years behind getting caught back up to where you need to be again. Okay. So, so why would you do? Why would you buy yields from a multiplier? You just mentioned it. The hassle, that, and then yeah. the, the lack of the ability to actually make the best yield. So between the hassle and I can't do it like the professional would do it, that's why you would buy it. Right, right. Uh, you know, a lot of the time a, a multiplier is set up that that is what they do, and that's what they're very good at doing, right? So they they have everything in place to make that that really good guilt, and then they have the, the resources to uh, manage that effectively and then to get that out to, to the commercial farm. So. A lot of the time, we we kind of would take a step back and go, okay, let's let's let the professionals handle that, right? That's what they're designed to do. We were more in, we were designed to run commercial pigs and or commercial sow farms, I should say, and then uh, send out the commercial pigs to the shareholders, right? So mm -hmm. just to ensure that we could have the best genetic progress in the farm, well, let's let the the farms that are designed to do that uh, do that. Up. Okay, so now you, you referenced it already. We're we're doing more of our own multiplication versus buying from somebody else that's doing that job. Mm -hmm. uh, we built some barns recently. Can you comment on uh, okay where, which companies, or just how many companies we're dealing with? It's, it's not just one, but maybe the, the scope and the location of where we're doing this right now. Yeah, so uh, currently uh, we are in construction on a, a couple different, or finishing construction and actually in the process of stocking on a few different uh, farms that would be genetic multipliers. And these would be a variety of genetic companies. Um, you know, by the, by the end of the year, we're going to be at almost 25,000 sows uh, within genetic multiplication, guilt multiplication. So uh, we're, we're very proud of that. And it's a, it's a fast growth, right? We're, we're experiencing that. Uh, you know, what goes into multipliers and, and why did we, want to do this well first of all it's location right uh multipliers because they're they're such a high health female because we take those gilts and put them into all the commercial sow farms they need to be in a very good location what does that mean well when i say a very good location i mean away from pigs we do not want pigs in their area just because of the risk of spreading disease uh you know i i want to I want to build my sow farm where it's geographically isolated, the middle of nowhere, you know, South Dakota, Missouri, wherever, right? I don't want to have it in Northwest Iowa where I have a bunch of finishers just a quarter mile down the road from there. I want the lowest risk of a disease break as possible when we when we build these multipliers. Okay, so location, big deal. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you go through the, the other setups of what makes a multiplier a good multiplier? Because location is one of them, but then there's a whole scad of other things that could be hit point by point. For If you're assessing 
oh, is my multiplier that I'm buying yields from good or not? That you would say these are the important things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, other than uh, other than the main point, I think that would go into it would be just what does the shareholders, what do they want the genetics to be their sell farm, right? That kind of narrows it down on, on what ones they would choose from. But when we go into stocking and building a multiplier, the health of it is number one. And some of that is just the, the economic implications of that, right? One multiplier can feed yields into many sow farms, right? 15 to maybe even 20 different sow farms. So uh, when we think of PERS, for instance, per, a PERS break today on a commercial sow farm can cost, you know, a million dollars or more, very easily more today. Well, if we take that times 20 now on the multiplier level, well, the economic impact of that gets very large. So that's why health is is number one when it comes to multipliers. And what do we do to defend health? Well, number one is a great location. And then from there, uh, we ensure that everything is isolated around that. And that includes, uh, that includes a feed source, right? Ensuring that we don't have diseases travel within feed. Uh, we get away from pigs by the location, ensure that diseases aren't coming from air or along the road. The feed thing. Yep. What I mean, what diseases can come through feed? How would you worry about them besides location of the feed mill? What else do you do? Other things in the feed or just location of the feed mill? Yeah. So um, after Scott D and some others and at K State and et cetera have done uh, multiple studies proven that diseases can transfer in the feed. Uh, PED is really how that got started. And then they started doing work with foreign animal diseases. But then we've proven as well that PERS can also travel in the feed. So uh, other than ensuring that our mills are biosecure, we also add what are called feed mitigants within the feed to inactivate or kill off any of those viruses that can be transmitted. So okay. uh, we do that on our multipliers um, continuously, and then there'd also be multiple uh, uh, multiple commercial cell farms that we would run that in as well, just to try and reduce the disease risk. Okay. Uh, air filters, you mentioned the air. That part of the yep yep our our multipliers would be filtered uh, just to further mitigate any disease risk. Again, when we talk about the implications of a health challenge at a multiplier level, it's to be very high. So we want to have all the stops in place to prevent a disease break uh, that we have at our disposal. So uh, our multipliers would be uh, filtered. So all the incoming air into the south farm, there's filters that that air has to pass through. It would capture any potential viruses that could be in the air. Okay, what else? Yeah, other things that we'd look at, uh, uh, we're very stringent on our biosecurity in general, and uh, a lot of the practices that we do at our normal commercial cell farms, that also occurs at our multiplier levels. This would be uh, you know, a, a locked entrance that visitors have to be checked in with uh, uh, the farm manager and the supervisor ahead of time. And then they would have to be buzzed into the entrance. Everyone has to sign a logbook when they come in. Uh, we would have a Danish bench entry as we initially come into the farm or at least into the entryway. Uh, all visitors would have to shower in to the farm as well. There'd be dedicated clothes uh, uh, on the barn side that stay at the farm, washed, etc. cetera. Uh, all of us. Uh, we don't allow lunches to be brought in, as that could potentially be a disease risk on the bag itself, or if employees brought pork into the farm. So uh, pork being brought in can carry diseases. We know it could with ASF being one, but if a pig was slaughtered and that pig had furs, and I brought raw meat in into a farm and that pig had furs, right? there's potential that that meat is contaminated with furs and then I, I just brought that into the farm. So we actually have a, a office coordinator at our multipliers and that office coordinator, they, they help with the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, records keeping, things like that within the farm. But they also cook meals for the employees at the farm just to ensure that we've got control of any food or any outside uh, food that would be coming in. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting, just the level of, because uh, biosecurity that's intensified over time, and you said, "Oh, our multipliers." Well, really, they're just what we're doing at the commercial farms. And I thought, "You're right. We do those things at the commercial farms." In fact, 
the ironic thing is, as we did those things, we got very good at that. Then we'd go and visit the people that were selling us gilts and realize our commercial farms were way more secure than where we're buying gilts, or to some level more secure, where we thought, well, we should do this on our own. It feels like you put the put them in the wrong order a little bit. So I don't want to be too critical, except I think the commercial farm side of things was a good place to develop a lot of great biosecurity for filter farms. Mm-hmm. Is that accurate? Did I frame that right? I think, yeah. Yeah, I think that's very accurate. You know, uh, uh, one one major reason on why have we gone more towards multipliers for our shareholders, uh, it's so we have control of that, right? Previously, if we if we purchase guilds, right, we don't always have controls. So there's things that you would note when you made the decisions to purchase, and it, it would kind of be frustrating because we want to ensure that we've got the the full control and we can implement all the stops that prevent breaks, right? Uh, it it's always frustrating when we're bringing in guilds from an outside source, right, and that multiplier breaks. Then we got to scramble to find a different source. Uh, you go to a different genetic source or different multiplier to bring in gilts, and then there's you know different bugs that can come in with those gilts, different diseases. So mm-hmm. uh, always frustrating when, <clears throat> when that has to go. So we want control so we can ensure that all the stops are in place to prevent that from yeah. happening. Yeah, and I think it's the control piece that, that gives us comfort in mm-hmm. the system. But I'm thinking of these units are set up, some are set up to supply only our shareholders, or primarily. But some are set up where it's filling gilts for our shareholders, but maybe the bulk of the gilts are being sold off to customers out there that aren't part of our of our managed, management company, management farms. It, uh, and so there are people listening to the audience that are going to be shareholders in Pipestone managed farms, and they're going to be people out there listening that may buy gilts from some of these locations. So it's a mixed bag out there of people listening that, that might apply to this. Right, right. Absolutely a mixed bag. Um, yeah, I, I want to make that clear that the multipliers that we're managing they do not supply to only our farms or only our shareholders. Uh, there are gilts in those that get sold off, and yeah, about half, right? That's a that's actually a good number, Spencer. About half of the gilts going out uh, are sold off to outside clients or outside sow farms. So, yeah, should be clear on that. Um, yeah, good point, well, Spencer. So I thought of something else. I've got a clean source of gilts, buying gilts from them. I'm comfortable with them. Oh, I lose them. Oh, I'm going to switch. Well, the other source is also clean. And when I say clean, I mean they don't have furs. They don't have mycoplasma. They, they, they check the boxes for being clean. What is, what's the problem with doing that? Because I know I have an opinion on that. What's your opinion on the problem with switching from one clean source, quote, unquote, to another clean source, quote, unquote? You know, a, a word I always hear, a phrase I always hear is triple negative. I hear that within the industry, throughout the industry. Oh, they're triple negative. What does that mean? Triple negative for a majority of the time, it means negative for furs, PD, and mycoplasma. Well, triple negative can be negative for furs, strep, and whatever, right? That's what I want to get at is uh, for so long, we have classified our gilts coming in as triple negative. Oh, yeah, they don't have furs, they don't have PD, and they don't have mycoplasma. Okay, that's great. But those aren't the only three diseases out there, right? So. We're going, we're going very in depth within the, the multipliers that we're managing to fully classify every organism or try to get as many diseases as we can classified so that when we make uh, guilt sourcing decisions for other, other sow farms, we're able to know how well they're going to mesh together with what's already in the farm. So uh, endemic bacterial agents are a key point that Spencer was getting at. Uh, of different kinds of streps, strep suis, different kinds of uh, homophilus parasuis, a suis, um, you know, you kind of name it. There's a lot of bacterial pathogens out there that we've seen in the past. We brought in a guilt source and we thought they were high health, but they had some strep that didn't match up with what the farm already had. And then that can be a, a frustration and a, a battle then for ongoing years. Yeah, it's a little bit buyer beware. Because the genetics company may pre- present you with, I got a clean source. Stop and do some homework, mm-hmm. make some phone calls, and figure out exactly what's going on. Maybe even get references on where that is. But you know, to the point of we we're doing this more on our own. You know, we, we're doing the homework hard because we've been through some of those battles. Yeah. Uh, 
one other thing, these farms are relatively big. They're not they're not a thousand head multiplier. They're I don't know what the range five thousand or more. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the question of size becomes more important. Talk about that a little bit. You know, if I got a if I got a stock of farm, if I'm a customer out there, I'm in a stock of farm. Why is size important? Yeah, uh, size is really important for us stocking, especially like Spencer said, because if I've got a, uh, you know, historically sow farms have gotten larger and larger and larger just because of scale, economies of scale, larger farms are more efficient. Well, if there's going to be a, a new farm built, or if I've got a farm where I had to depop it for whatever reason and restock it, the larger I can have for the guilt source to come in, the faster I can do that faster I can get it up to production. And then the other important thing is it can be a single source of guilds. So the whole uh, uh, endemic challenges and having different sources, right? And having those diseases have to get acclimated and work themselves out over the years in the farm. If I bring in a, a single source, which I'm able to do with a large multiplier, that's very beneficial for any farm that's stocking in the country. You've had farms that we've approached genetics companies with the, the prop, proposition of, hey, you want to stock the farm? Can you source us the gills? They say, I can. I'm going to pull out a here and here and here. And the reaction is, no, not one farm. Can you do it? Oh, no. But we can combine three sources. No, no, sorry, no. Yeah. I mean, that'd be an accurate statement, I think, for how we've approached it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the other, uh, the other challenge that we've had over almost the last two years now has just been gilt availability. Uh, I think a lot of people are aware and have seen how how widespread PERS has been in the last two years as well. PERS hasn't only been affecting the finishers, it's been affecting sow farms, and it has mm-hmm. been affecting different multipliers out there as well. Uh, so that's gotten to be a challenge over the last two years or so has been just guilt availability. Well, hopefully if we have large multipliers that can handle uh, bigger stockings and are in very good areas with very good biosecurity, mm-hmm. we can uh, kind of secure uh, more guilt availability and sources for the coming years. Yeah. Nothing would be more frustrating than having your guilt flow interrupted constantly by losing a bar here or there that's going positive, or worse yet, go positive and you get the guilts, and then you're really disrupted. Absolutely. Um, all right. Any more comments on biosecurity? Things that might be on your mind that's worth covering? Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think overall, you know, we just try to manage everything we can, keep every disease out. Um, a lot of stops in place. Obviously, we're always trying to improve, but I, no further comments than that, Spencer. Okay, so for our listeners, if you have any questions, Evan Cope, you could ask for Dr. Big Cat, I suppose, if you called in. But uh, Dr. Evan Cope uh, is working with some of these multipliers. Um, he's a smart young guy. I shouldn't say young. I would make you, well, you are young compared to me, but you're getting some gray hairs soon. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I am blonde, so that gray is hard to see, but yeah. 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 No, it's coming. I guarantee it's going to come. Yeah. Uh, but call and ask for Evan. Uh, he'll have good answers to questions on this. Um, as always, if you have any questions of any kind, call our main line, ask for me, ask for anybody. Okay. Dr. Cole, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, our listeners out there, thank you for joining us for this podcast. I invite you to check back in for our next episode. I don't know who that will be with, but somebody interesting as well. Thank you. Swine Time Podcast was created for the pork industry and individual pork producers around the country. Hosted by Dr. Spencer Wayne with the Pipestone Veterinary Services, the podcast contains pork industry news, advancements in animal care, and how to enhance your productivity. Monthly podcasts are available on Spotify, Google Music, iTunes, Anchor, and on www.pipestone.com.